So anyway, that's 60 seconds of uh, me looking back a bit uh, on a bit of my life. And I wonder what would happen if we all look back in 50 years from now. What would happen, I wonder, if we had a reunion of all of us here in this room exactly 50 years from now? And maybe we'd reminisce that, I don't know, maybe when we were back when we were 17, we wanted to pass our driving test. Yeah? We wanted to be liberated from the humiliation of being dropped off by our mum before a party and then picked up again by our mum after a party. And so we desperately wanted to pass our test. And when we passed our driving test, that was great for a while. But then we realised there was that horrible realisation that the only car we were insured to drive was mum's car. And mum's car was a car of shame. (laughs) Mum's car was not fast. Mum's car was not cool. No, mum's car was designed for driving to Aldi and back at 25 miles an hour. (laughs) And we wanted to get a real car. And we wanted to get our own car. So we we save, we save, we save. And eventually we have our own car. And it was great for a while because it was technically a car. But we realised that there were other people and they had real cars. We wanted a real car. Now, you can fill in the blanks with whatever is the equivalent in your story. But what we do know for a fact is that tonight, all over Britain, there are couples who are looking into each other's eyes right now and saying these words. Darling, if only we could get out of rented. If only we could get our foot on the bottom rung of the property ladder. And so you save and you save and you save and then eventually... You do get your own place. And it's great for a while. But then, after a couple of years, it's just a bit too small. And so, you look into your wife's eyes and you say these words, Darling, if only we could convert the loft. And so you save and you save and save. And after four years of saving, finally you do convert the loft. And then there comes that great day. Where for the first time you ascend the staircase that never even used to exist. And you enter your newly converted love space and you spin around and you say, yes, finally I have arrived. I have more cubic feet than I have ever had before. (laughs) And that's great for a while. And then after about two or three years, you look into your wife's eyes and you say, you know what? It'd be great if we we could have some children who we could store in our converted (laughs) love. And then after all sorts of heartache and years of trying, eventually you do have these children, and maybe that's, that's, that's great for a while. And these, these children, they actually kind of attach themselves to your legs, and you walk around this house, these people <laughs> attach to your legs, and after a while you begin to look forward to a time when these children will eventually leave your house. <laughs> because when your children have left home, mark my words, when you reach the age of 60, you too are going to want to go on a cruise. (laughs) And so you save and you save and you save and you amass this vast amount of money and then you buy your two tickets for your cruise and you drive to Southampton and you get onto your cruise liner and for those two weeks, you lounge on the deck. People serve you food morning, by noonday, the sun beats down and you lounge around you think, yes, this is it. This is the life I've always wanted But then on the last day of your cruise, you feel a little bit depressed because you think, oh, I've got to go back to work tomorrow. But then you think, hey, only another five years of work, then I'll be able to retire. Then finally, I will be free. But on your first week back at home from your cruise, the phone rings. It's your son. He says, oh, hi, Dad. Yeah, um, yeah, my wife and I, we'd love to get out of rented. We'd love to get our foot on the bottom rung of the property ladder. So, Dad, we were kind of wondering whether you and Mum, maybe you could kind of look after and maybe raise our three children, uh, your three grandchildren. Would that be okay? And you can't say no to your own flesh and blood. You say, yes. And you put the phone down and you think, what have I done? <laughs> what, what, what have I just committed us to? What, what, what was that? And then maybe a year later, the phone rings again. This time it's your daughter. And she says, oh, hi, Mum. Yeah, yeah, my husband and I, we'd love to get out of rent. We'd love to get our foot on the bottom rung of the property ladder. We were just wondering, maybe could you and Dad, could you kind of look after and maybe raise our four children, your four grandchildren? Would that be okay? And you say, oh, yes, dear. 
And you put the phone down and think, what have I done? In those five years, you commit to raising all 14 of your grandchildren. And then finally, after raising these 14 grandchildren, you finally get the last of the 14 grandchildren off your hands. And finally, you are free. But you are now 85 years old. (laughs) And you're exhausted. And you think, was that it? Was that life? You know, you and I can live our whole lives and never really investigate whether there is a purpose to life. We can live life without ever taking the time to research if there is a reason why we're here. Britain's most distinguished atheist, Bertrand Russell, said that everything that we think, everything that we think, say, or do is futile. Bertrand Russell said the only foundation that we can build our lives on is one of unyielding despair. Despair because, in his view, Actually, life ultimately is pointless. So we can pretend otherwise, but if we do, we are only deceiving ourselves. Now, was Bertrand Russell correct? Jesus of Nazareth's view is the exact opposite of Bertrand Russell's view. Jesus says, you're alive for a reason. Jesus says there really is a loving God who always planned that one day you would exist. And that this loving God has made you deliberately on purpose in the hope of having a love relationship with you. In this life and in the next. Now that's an exciting claim. But is it true? I mean, what actually is the true truth? That's what our title tonight asks. In this first century document, we get an insight into what people thought about Jesus Before his death and resurrection. In the first few months of Jesus' spectacular healing and teaching career, he made a huge impact. And he was making some outrageous claims about his own importance. And Jesus had caused a massive stir. And people were trying to get at the truth to find out who he really was. And so Jesus starts the conversation with his disciples by asking, Who do the crowd say I am? This is verse 18. He starts the conversation with them. He doesn't wait for you to start searching. And I'm so grateful for that personally because I wasn't looking for Jesus. I wasn't on a spiritual search. I didn't go to church. And I was perfectly happy as I was. But someone asked me. Somebody raised the subject with me. Just like Jesus is raising the subject here. At some point in your life, the question comes. And tonight, the question comes to you. Who do you think Jesus is? And the next verse gives us an insight into how people thought at the time, how people viewed Jesus at the time. Who is Jesus? Firstly, then some said John the Baptist, verse 19. So who's John the Baptist? Well, like Jesus, John the Baptist had been a major outdoor preacher um, He drew massive crowds. When this conversation is happening, he's recently been executed. But John the Baptist's ministry had been unforgettable. And the similarities between John the Baptist and Jesus were obvious. Um, So, for example, John had preached about the judgment to come. Jesus preached about this judgment day. John's going on about one day. There'll be a day when everybody will be judged by a holy God and so on. And Jesus is preaching the same kind of stuff. So people heard Jesus and thought, oh yeah, this is like a couple of months ago, that John the Baptist guy. Same sort of thing. Next in verse 19, others say Elijah. Well, why Elijah? Well, Elijah worked miracles. Elijah did major miracles. I mean, jaw-dropping stuff, which made people say, oh my goodness, look at what just happened. People said, God's here. What power, what authority. And when Jesus turned up, he got the same kind of reaction. Elijah lived hundreds of years beforehand. And he was a national hero. Elijah positively sought confrontation with the top brass of his day. And Elijah's speciality was kind of showdown miracles. And there were stupendous miracles. There were nature miracles. There were healings. Elijah's boldness was breathtaking. 
And Elijah just seemed to live in the supernatural. And when Jesus came to your town, people said the same kind of stuff. It's like, you know that stuff we read growing up? All those stories about Elijah, like our hero? It's like he's here in our town. Look at what just happened. And Jesus, like Elijah, deliberately did these sort of showdown, point-proving miracles. So one time, for example, Jesus was surrounded by all of these religious leaders of his day. And he says this, to prove, Jesus says, that I've got authority on earth to forgive sins. Watch this. Watch this. He says to a paralyzed man, get up. And straight away, the paralyzed man, his legs are made strong. He stands up. I mean, wow. People said, this is like having Elijah here, alive today. And still others, verse 19, one of the prophets long ago has come back to life. Okay, Jesus says in verse 20, so much for public opinion, what about you? Who do you say I am? And I wonder, what is your answer? Who do you think Jesus is? And Peter answers, God's Messiah. Now, the Jewish people have been waiting for the Messiah for hundreds of years. So this was a colossal thing for Peter to say. Suddenly, the Messiah is here. There were 322 Old Testament prophecies about this Messiah, all written hundreds of years beforehand, and Jesus fulfilled every one. George Heron, a French mathematician, studied 40 of the 322 prophecies. He calculated the chances of one man fulfilling an average lifespan, as many as 40 of the 322 prophecies, the chance was 1 in 10, with 157 zeros at the end of it. Another mathematician, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman, he chose 60 of these prophecies. He calculated the odds of one person fulfilling as many as 60 to be 1 in 10, with 895 zeros at the end of it. Yet despite the stupendous odds against it, Jesus fulfilled all 322 prophecies. And so Peter's saying, you're the one. You're him. The whole of the Old Testament is about you. Now, for any human being to worship another human being is a massive call. So what prompted Peter to take this extraordinary step to worship a 32-year-old man? And to say in Greek, you're the Christ of God, or in Hebrew, you're the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Savior who is to come into the world. What caused Peter to worship a carpenter? Well, for one thing, Peter had been there on the many occasions when Jesus healed all the sick in the region. So an entire town's worth of sick people would come out, Jesus would heal them all. Peter had watched this happen. One time a leper comes and says to Jesus, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus replies, I am willing, be clean. He's healed just like that. Peter had seen this happen. Lepers cleanse lame walking, blind seeing, the dead raised. On another occasion, Peter sees Jesus has got five loaves of bread, two fish, and a crowd of about ten to 12,000, maybe even as many as 20,000 hungry people. We have a problem. Jesus multiplies the loaves. They all eat. There's stuff left over. Peter had seen all of this. One time, Peter was in a boat with Jesus, and a furious storm comes up on the lake. Peter is an experienced professional fisherman. He and his fishing colleagues genuinely think this storm is so bad, they're likely to die. Peter's watching Jesus. Jesus stands up in the boat, and Jesus talks to the weather. He says, quiet, be still. And in that moment, the sea, the lake is as calm as a pond. And these fishermen are standing there, they're dripping wet, the the, 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 the sails are torn to shreds and they're just looking at this bloke and they're saying, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. So Peter says, look, you're the Christ, the Christ of God. And so we reach this sort of climactic moment where we're at the mountaintop. Peter says, you are the Christ, you're the Messiah. And Jesus reacts by saying, okay, finally you've got it. Now I'm going to drop the bombshell. Guys, I'm going to die soon. What? Yeah, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to arrest me. I'm going to die there. I am actually going to be raised from the dead three days later. But hey, first of all, I must be killed. 
Jesus had this way of referring to himself as the Son of Man, which doesn't mean a lot to us, but would have meant a lot to people who first heard this, who had read the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. He says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now why? Why must Jesus be killed? Well, I thought we'd start by maybe some light-hearted relief, a bit of humor, actually. Um, However, for this to work, I will need, if you don't mind, a show of hands. You will need to vote on something, if if you don't mind. So, first of all, this is an unpleasant task for you, but could you just all, please, for a moment, could you all just look at my face? Okay, look at my face. And I'd like you to raise your hand if, looking at my face, you think that I have a criminal record. Just raise your hand. One, two, three. Only three? Four. Okay, four. That's extraordinary. Okay, how many of you think I've not got a criminal record? Could you raise your hands? Okay. Uh, Well, you're all wrong. Um, I have got a criminal record. I mean, I really have got a criminal record. Um, So you look a bit shocked by that. (laughs) I have got a criminal record. Just please be forgiving. Yeah, I've got a criminal record. Uh, So the truth is this, that on the 9th of November, uh, 1988... I was arrested for harassment, alarm, yes I know, harassment, (laughs) it gets better, don't worry, harassment, alarm, distress, and willful obstruction of a highway. Hmm, Interesting, eh? So, um, it it wasn't so much my crime, I will tell you about my crime in a second, it was more the manner, the way in which I was arrested, that was really quite exciting. Uh, because I was arrested fleeing the scene of my crime. I jumped over, I'd run across two roads, I jumped over a fence, I was being chased by a police car with flashing sirens. Enjoying the story. Um, you could be my friend. Um, and the police car's chasing me. I jump over this fence, the police, uh, policemen jump out the car, they jump over the fence, and they're now chasing me. I am in a police chase. This is so exciting. And so I'm running away up this hill. I'm running up this hill through this muddy field. The two coppers are chasing me. The faster the two coppers is getting closer and closer. I can hear him getting closer. And then he comes right up behind me, and he, and he does this superb rugby tackle. And I go face down in the mud, and I thought to myself, that was cool. <laughs> I thought to myself, they must practice that. Because I was in full flight, and now suddenly I'm face down in the mud. And of course, I'm face down in the mud, and I'm thinking through all the cop TV shows that I've watched growing up. And and as you know, have these guys been on the wine? Are you like serving double measures down here? Anyway, um, so I'm face down in the mud. And of course, I'm thinking about all cop TV shows. And what happens on TV in cop TV shows? At this point, the policeman says, you're Nick, Sonny Jim. Do you know he actually said that? <laughs> I was so chuffed. So I, I got up from the mud and I said to him, look, I said, look, you know, I, I, I really want to say that it was really quite exciting. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually from Wimbledon and um, I, I just want to say thank you. That was really quite exhilarating, the chasing. <laughs> all the tackling and the... That was super, you know. It would be very, very good fun. And so... Uh, then, of course, I think what happens on TV at this point is they put the, the policeman, as you probably know, they, they put your arm up your back like this, and they might, he did that as well. I was delighted. So I'm going off to the, to the police car, and as I got towards the police car, as you know on TV, what happens is that um, as you get to the police car, the, the doors are open, one of the police officers puts their hand on your head and pushes you down as if you've never got into the back seat of a car ever before. And so he pushes me down. And I'm, in, I'm going in the car, so I, I go down to the station, I empty out my pockets. Now, you may, you may be wondering by this stage, what was the harassment? What was the alarm? What was the willful obstruction of a highway? Well, I have to tell you that I was a student at the time. And what had happened was, I'd gone back to the college where I lived, and I'd noticed that a group of about 20 of my friends had got hold of quite a large felled tree that they were moving to block a road that led to a rival and, in our opinion, inferior college. <laughs> and I thought this was a good thing. I thought it was a good thing to deny public access to this institution, which I personally felt was of no value at all. So I joined in, and we, we, we basically cordoned it off. And um, at, at that point, the flashing blue lights appeared, and, um, and then all my mates scarpered, and I remember thinking, no, you, you, you don't need to run away. I mean, the, the police are reasonable people. I, I'm, from, I'm from Wimbledon, I can explain this to them. We can have a reason. And I thought, as the police car got really close, I thought, no, 
<laughs> Probably this is wrong. Probably this is going to turn out to be harassment, alarm, distress, and willful obstruction of a highway. And so because I was the last to leave the scene of my crime, I was also the easiest to catch. But that wasn't my first sin. That was just like my first publicly recorded sin. <laughs> no, there are lots of times when I knew what the right thing to do was, but didn't do it. And the God who really exists knows all about what I've done, said, and thought. All the times when I just pleased myself and I thought, you know what, blow the consequences. All the times when I pushed God to the margins of my life. All the time in my thoughts and deeds, I've done things and not done other things that I should have done. And that is all absolutely connected to why Jesus says here, I must be killed. Now, why would that be? What is the connection between me choosing to distance myself from God and Jesus saying, I must go to Jerusalem and be killed? What's going on there? Let me see if I can explain the connection as I close by telling you a story of something that happened in 1937. In 1937, a man called John Griffiths operated a swing bridge that was over the Mississippi River. It's a bit like Tower Bridge in that it has arms that can be raised and ships can go through. But, the difference being Tower Bridge has road traffic, this bridge carried rail traffic, the Memphis Express train. So, on this particular occasion, the arms of the bridge are upraised. It's the summer, and that's relevant because it's a school summer holidays. John Griffiths has got his son Greg with him. Son Greg is... Uh, 12 years old. And what's happening is that Greg's come to clean the gears. And so he's in the gear mechanism cleaning the gears. John Griffiths is in the control tower on the other side of the river with the bridge upraised. At this point, John Griffiths hears the sound that he's dreaded his entire working life. He hears the sound of the Memphis Express train coming at 80 miles an hour. Now, the fact he can hear the, uh, the, the steam train with the arms up raised, means that already the train's gone through two stop signals. There must be at least two faults on the line. The fact he can hear the engine. Now, that wasn't his problem. He, was so, he trained his whole life for this sort of thing, and he's got just enough time. He's so skilled at it, he can actually get the arms of the bridge down quick enough. That's not his problem. His problem is that his son, Greg, is in the mechanism, in the gear mechanism on the other side of the bridge. And this is before the days of mobile phones. So he just... Shouts at the top of his voice, Greg, Greg, calling out. But he's only got a split second, and he's got a horrible dilemma. On the one hand, if he keeps the arms of the bridge upraised, he can save Greg's life. But it means that any minute now, all the passengers, the carriages will concertina into the upraised arms of the bridge, and then either the passengers will die on impact, or as the carriages tumble down the people will be drowned in the river below. Or, alternatively, he's got just enough time, he can lower the arms of the bridge, but, of course, he would crush his son Greg in the mechanism. And he's got to choose. He's got to be one or the other. So what John Griffiths did that day was he, he buried his head, his face in his arm like this, and he reached for the gear lever, and he pulled it back. And he, he never heard the screams of his son Greg as Greg was crushed to death. All he heard was just the rattle of the Memphis Express train as it went safely across the bridge. 400 passengers. And that day, a loving father, John Griffiths, chose to sacrifice his one and only son, Greg, just so that the many could be saved. And those passengers arrived in Memphis and of course, they were told subsequently about the amazing event that had happened on the bridge. And they could honestly say, those passengers could honestly say, the only reason why I've been saved is because Greg Griffiths died instead of me. Because Greg Griffiths died, I didn't. The reason why I'm alive and well today is because Greg Griffiths died in my place. And there's a substitution there. And in some way, Jesus is thinking of a substitution when he says here to his friends, I must be killed. Because here's the situation. Yes, it's true. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we bring upon ourselves the result or the punishment, the implication of death will be separated from God forever. 
But because God loves you so much, the Bible says, Christ chooses to go to Jerusalem and to die in our place instead of every single one who trusts in him. Christ died for you. So what's your response? Anyone can pray a simple prayer like this. A prayer that says, Father God, I'm sorry for the wrong things I've done, for the times I put myself first. I've sinned and fallen short of your glory. But thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross in my place as my substitute instead of me. I'm turning to you. You are my saviour and Lord. Amen. And I'd just like to finish by reading that prayer once more. But as I do, if you'd like to, you can pray that prayer. You needn't say it out loud. But as I say those words, you can make them your own. Just silently in your heart, say yes to Christ. And say yes to this Father who loves you enough to give up his only Son just so that you could safely go across to safety. So why don't we pray? Let's pray, shall we, just for 30 seconds. When I finish reading this prayer, we'll be done. Let's pray, shall we? And maybe you're here tonight, and as I say these words, you're praying them in your heart. You're saying something like this, Father God, Father God, 